Louis Christopher, welcome to Property Insights, mate. Uh, good to be with you, Mark. I think it was about like, uh, I think I quickly said outside of, I think the last time I saw you was, we were in, it was, you said it was 2019, but I don't even know what it was for, but it was some sort of summit that we were asked, we'll yeah, call it up we, to. we were down in a, the housing summit at Canberra. Yeah. Talking about Labor's negative gearing policy that they were bringing That's to the right. election that year. But, but the Libs were in at the time. That's right. The Libs, because I think it was, um, might have been Josh, or it might have been the Prime Minister. Actually, I think it was. They were uh, both there. They were both there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and I remember sitting there thinking to myself, "This guy talks a lot of sense." You, that is, I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, so, one of the reasons I wanted to invite you on today was to sort of look at your insights, but um, probably more importantly, from the very beginning, to introduce SQM, which, by the way, I'm dying to know what SQM stands for. Which is your business, SQM Research? It's a economics sort of research hub around housing, interest rates, various other things. Um, what does SQM stand for? Uh, it's the abbreviation for square meter. Square meter, it, it, because you like measuring things. Is that what it is? You got it. It's all about measurement. And uh, and what what's your background first? Uh, where did you what you where did you get this sort of a skill from? Yeah, uh, well, I've always had a passion for investment markets, not just property, uh, but shares, funds, various asset classes. I think that passion arose through my grandparents who actually raised me. I'm a double orphan, you see. And What, what does a double orphan mean? It means you lose both your mother and your right. father. I'm sorry to hear that. No, it's all right. It's all right. Now been, it's all right. I regarded myself as being actually very yeah. lucky because my grandparents did raise me and they raised me the right way. And my grandfather was an accountant. So in my younger years, I had all these financial reports all around me from the ages of five onwards. And my granddad used to take me down to the Sydney Stock Exchange, as it was known then, when I it was remember. an open cry system. So I had this exposure at a very young age. What drove me towards this area wasn't just that exposure, it was actually through a really negative experience, particularly on the property front. So when my grandfather passed away, and I was 14 at the time, it was just my grandmother raising me at that time. And she was ripped off on a bad property deal by a very dodgy property manager on the Gold Coast. And I was too young to try and stop it. I could see it, but she couldn't see it. And if only we had more information, better information about what the market was doing, she wouldn't have been ripped off. And she wasn't rich. You know, she was just a, a middle-class person just trying to get by, trying to raise a, a grandson. Uh, but to see that firsthand, really, it, it really shook me and it stayed on my mind for a long time. So I think the combination of loving investment markets but wanting to do better by commuter, uh, consumers in terms of having better information is what I'm all about. And so SQM was born. I don't know, how old is that business now going? Uh, I s launched that in 2006. Oh, wow. Is that uh, more recent? It's only 20 or 18 years old. Yeah. Right? So before then, I was head of research of a company you may have heard of called Australian Property Monitors. Yeah, I do. Remember um, them. So they're they, still around? They're still around. They're owned 100% by domain these days. Right. Okay. Uh, but back then, they were only 50% owned by domain. And so we had a lot of independence in terms of being able to put out auction clearance rates and so forth. So I was their head of research and then their general manager for about six years. And then domain bought it. Uh, and you know, nothing on domain, but I just didn't like that culture. And, and by that time, I was keen to get out there and run my own show. And so we got SQN going from scratch. So what – okay. Now, just to – Give me a bit of a, a broadsheet on SQM. Yeah. Um, what is SQM interested in today and yeah. what is it delivering in terms of perhaps metrics or measurements or analytics to the marketplace? Yeah, so there's actually two main businesses. Uh, firstly, the one that uh, mums and dads know us best for is that we provide property data. So we compete with CoreLogic. And PropTrack. And PropTrack. Yep. Uh, and, of course, Domain, my old yep. company. Uh, so we compete with them. And then on the other side, the side which is less known by mums and dads is that we actually issue ratings on managed funds. So if you know Morningstar, yep. Lonsec, Zenith, we compete with them on that front. Right. So you're in, in another asset, a completely different asset class. Exactly. So let, if we go and have a look at um, the more, I don't know, less more consumable, more consumer-orientated uh, asset class, which is real estate, hmm. 
Um, do you cover the whole of the country? Yes, we do. Yeah. So, what are you looking at? What are the sort of some of the things you look at from week to week? We have our own series and auction clearance rates, uh, which are predominantly focused on Sydney and Melbourne, but it's a, a most timely uh, measurement of the market, as I'm sure you're well aware. Uh, we measure advertised rents. In fact, we were the first to put out a series based on online listings uh, quite some years back. We measure asking prices as well, so what vendors are, are doing in the marketplace. On sale or, or, or on rents you're doing? For about? sale, yep. uh, for rents, and then, of course, sold. So we also have median house prices based on actual sold records, and we have license agreements with each state VG. Uh, what's that? Value with general. Vendor sold. general, right. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So if – it must be pretty interesting then. So if someone like you sort of gets to see trends. Yeah. So trends are important from a data point of view. Yeah. I mean, there's no point in me knowing what happened last week. I mean, it's sort of interesting, but yeah. I'm more interested in trends. Yeah. Same. And and so is an audience more yeah. interested in the trends, or they should be more interested in the trends. What are the some of the more interesting trends you saw? Say, let's say during COVID, or maybe not at the beginning of COVID, but you know, sort of as COVID progressed and there was lots of money freed up into the system. What are the sort of trends in relation to property um, yeah, that you saw? The, the, the outbreak of COVID and the housing market was most interesting. So the first thing that happened uh, was that auction clearance rates collapsed. And this was before the, the federal government announced any stimulus right. at all to try and salvage the economy. Uh, so all the leading indicators were suggesting the housing market was about to have a major correction. It didn't. And that is because the government did come to the party and save the economy by all the various measures we're, we're well aware of. The other, well, the one of the things, uh, Louis, that most people aren't aware of is the TFF. I mean, uh, the um, uh, the funding facility, the term funding facility yes. that the RBA offered to the banking system, because yes. it wasn't really ever announced, because it's not a government thing; it was an RBA no. thing, and that's where all these people were able to get, you know, one point nine nine percent fixed rate for three years. That was a huge stimulus to the uh, real estate market. Absolutely, it was. I mean, you know, when you when you bring down the cash rate to near zero percent, and you've got lending rates running at two to three percent out there, massive stimulus. I think it was that combined with the government stimulus as well. Yeah. Uh, you may recall that for small businesses, uh, we got a, a break in terms of GST. Um, PAYG as well. I recall that as a small business operator at the time. And I think that saved the bacon for many, many businesses out there. Of course, many shop fronts still got smashed, as we all know. Uh, when you close up the streets, this is what happens. And but JobKeeper as well yep. was brought but, but, so, but what did you see after a sh very short period of time? Yeah, I think uh, once that stimulus came in place, sorry, the other trend that occurred was, was that we were recording a sharp rise in rental vacancy rates. Already but, were you? Yes. Wow. So this was back in March, April 2020. Vacancy rates just absolutely shot up um, shortly after the lockdowns. Wow. And they shot up uh, in the CBD locations and they shot up in the holiday locations in particular. Well, so, what why, why, why do you think that was the cause of that? Well, no one could take any holidays for starters. Oh, yeah. And I think uh, business trips <clears throat> were all but kaput, of course, uh, at the time. Uh, going away for a weekend wasn't, wasn't happening. Uh, so I think the combination of those factors, but also what was happening was that we were seeing an exodus out of the cities to try and get away from COVID, to try and get away from the lockdowns. And so the trend we had in later 2020 and going into 21 was that regional rental vacancy rates, after initially rising, sharply fell. Yeah. And they, they fell to record lows. Because people want to get to those in places and sort of hide away. Correct, yeah. Over and above that, people were looking for larger places because they were working from home. So towards the end of 2020, we also noticed a reversal in these sky-high rental vacancy rates in the cities. They started to fall and then fall rather quickly. And so across 2021 and into 2022, rental vacancy rates for most cities fell well under 2%. Uh, and in some cities, they actually fell, by, uh, fell below 1%. And that was because I think people were looking for uh, essentially, as mentioned, more room. They were working from home. They were staying in the city, but they were looking for whole premises. 
Um, Less people per apartment, for example. Yes, correct. Before, like, you know, if we were young guys, you and I might have shared the rent in that place. I yep. might have one bedroom, you had the other bedroom. Yes. Um, and then we shared the rest of the facilities. But now what you're saying is uh, it would be just you because you say, look, Mark, that's cool. I, I want this bedroom. I want the other room for my work. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Now, those vacancy rates stayed low. Uh, when we had the borders open, of course, we had a massive wave of overseas arrivals and that put further pressure on the rental market across 2022 and, and into 2023 and indeed this year as well. And I think the current state of play with the rental market as we speak is that vacancy rates still remain tight. Uh, we've got uh, a population that's growing fast than what we can build for. Uh, I don't see that alleviating itself really anytime soon, but I will say that what we're seeing with rents at this point in time is that the market has largely priced in a lot of the rental crisis now. So rents have actually in the recent few months of starting to flatline in our, across our capital cities and not rising at the rate of 10 to 20% that we saw across 2022. The annual rate now has fallen for most capital cities back down to about 4 to 5%. But there's not going backwards though. It's not going backwards, but there are some cities now recording some slight falls. Right. Uh, so Melbourne, for example, the last quarter, we've recorded about a 1% decline in rents. Keeping in mind, rents have risen massively. Yeah, so it's not really that bad. Yeah. But at the same time, it is indicating perhaps a different trend. Correct. It, it, yeah. and, 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 and Louis, is that because the rental decline, for example, in Melbourne by 1%, yeah. it's only a small amount and it's only for, what, a quarter, I think you said. That's right. Um, is that because there's less demand or is it because the demand isn't willing to pay? any more money. In other words, the landlords uh, I, have sucked the oxygen out of the system. Yeah. Look, I think it's a combination of the two. So I think how tenants have responded to the sky high rents is that they've been sharing together more. They've been grouping together more after that period where they wanted a home just to themselves and not share with anyone. Due to the sky high rents, they're, they're now being forced to share. So that's occurred. Um, also, we speak of the rental crisis, but I would argue that it hasn't further deteriorated. So as mentioned, this notion that uh, a lot of the bad news has been priced in now into weekly rents. For rents to rise further from here, you'd have to see a further deterioration in the rental crisis. In other words, vacancy rates would have to fall further from where we are now. It's probably impossible to fall further. I mean, <laughs> it's I mean like you're, you're zero percent. They're only zero anyway. Well, they're definitely yeah. round one or less, one yeah. percent or less. In, yeah. in most cases, less than one percent. Yeah. So it, it, it's sort of like, I mean, I guess you can get into negative. You could have negative um, vacancy rates. In other words, there's just no vacancies. In fact, there's people walking around with nowhere to, with nowhere to live. Like, well, I, yes, I guess you could. Uh, and the concern going forward is that it looks like our population for this year has expanded by another 500,000 people. On our numbers, it looks like we'll, we'll build or complete about 150,000 dwellings. So there'll be a shortage again this year uh, of accommodation that could put downward pressure on vacancy rates as we get towards the end of the year once again. So if I'm an investor... Um, which I'm, I guess, if I'm an investor, then would I be still, would I be still trying, be interested in buying property in some of the metro capital, well, the capital cities or the metros um, in Australia, perhaps on, let's say on the East Coast where I live, um, because my rental return still should be very good or has that all been priced in to the purchase price? It's It's been priced in to an extent, but you can get, good yields at this time. The question will be, will rents rise further over and above uh, today's rents? And I suspect what we'll actually see, provided the rental crisis doesn't deteriorate further, uh, is that rents will rise more in line with CPI or the inflation rate going forward. So in other words, it, it, which probably means the yield that I'm going to get is is already set. In other words, it's, it's, set. it's back, right. at, back at your normal three for residential, three and a half, four perhaps. Yeah, depending on where you are around yeah. the country, there's some great areas where you can, you can get a gross rental yield of 6% plus. Yeah, you might yeah. be up in, um, you know, up in um, 
north of Brisbane. You might. Be. Yeah, yeah, Moreton Bay or somewhere like that, or you might be some part of Adelaide perhaps. Yep, that's right. Or better than if you go down to Canberra, you're not going to be seeing that. You're not going to be seeing that. You won't see that in Melbourne. Melbourne average rents are running, uh, average yields are running at about 3%. Right, and in yeah. Sydney? Sydney, they're a little bit higher than Melbourne by a, a quarter of a percentage point, so you know, three and a quarter to three and a half percent, depending whereabouts you look in city and what type of property you buy. So the agents that I've had in here more recently on this show, um, Property Insights, um, have been saying to me, as of now, we're seeing a, a lot more stock available for auction than we have seen in previous uh Periods like yes. previous similar periods, say yes. this time last year, this time the year before. Yep. And uh, what are you guys seeing there at SQM? Yeah, that, that's right. For Sydney in particular, we're up by no, Sydney about, in particular. Yeah, we're up by about seventeen percent uh, compared to this time last year in terms. Is of Is that a big increase? Things. I mean, seventeen percent relative to other periods is is that an out, an outlier increase? It, oh, in terms of percentage. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit abnormal, but in terms of the absolute number of listings out there, we're just back to long-term average le- uh, levels for Sydney. So give, give me a bit of a feel for that. So let's say Sydney, I know, and on, it, on any one weekend, what would have 2,000 listings? What are we looking at? Oh, no, in terms of total listings out there, uh, for a course of a month, you'd be looking at about 45,000 listings for Sydney. Right. So so you were saying that right now, even with a 17% increase in Sydney, yep. that's yep. just bringing us back up to sort of pre-COVID numbers? Pre-COVID levels, that's right. Pre-COVID levels. Yep. So if I go back a year, yep. um, this time last year, yep. so we were 17% less, say, in Sydney, um, we were way le- lower than – our pre-COVID levels. Oh, my word, we were. We were near record lows. And would you attribute the price rises and the um, speed at which places were sold and the um, the de- just the general demand of people inspecting and turn up to auctions, would you attribute that to that very factor, that one factor, like um, supply not, e- not me- getting anywhere near needing to meet demand? Yes, ultimately, that's what it does mean. Now, you've got to look at well, why supply hasn't met demand. And listings, the total number of listings is, is often swayed by the increases and decreases in demand and as well as uh, how vendors see the market. Now, up until now, vendors have never been forced sellers in this country, really. Mm. So when the market gets a bit soft, they tend to withdraw their properties Yeah, more often than not. So why not now? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, potentially, uh, they many of them are stretched – uh, of course, you may recall the beginning of this year, there was a great expectation that we're all about to have an interest rate cut. I remember it well. Didn't happen. And uh, they're talking about August, September this year, rate yeah, cuts. Yeah, they were, but there were, there were some uh, media reports to suggest it could happen as early as March, April. Um, and so when the market opened at the beginning of 24, uh, we noticed a bit of a jump in buyer activity and, and sellers lifted their asking prices across the cities. But that interest rate uh, cut, that expected interest rate cut, didn't materialise. And I think as the year went on, there was a lot more uncertainty and concern on, on both sides, particularly the concern on the vendor side, that an interest rate cut wasn't forthcoming. And so I think for a number of vendors, especially those who were right on the edge, in terms of trying to meet their mortgage repayments, uh, perhaps a number of them now have said, right, well, we don't know when this rate cut's coming. It might not come for some time yet. Uh, I think it's now time to sell uh, and reduce our reduce our debt. I had Warren Hogan in that chair about two weeks ago and he was actually saying that we should actually have an interest rate rise. Yeah, yeah, I, I know Warren and he was forecasting uh, up to three interest rate rises this year. I don't think that's going to happen now. I understand where he was coming from, that uh, there was still a lot of inflation in the system. Uh, And there's no doubt that the Reserve Bank uh, made messages to suggest that they were not going to rule out a rate rise this year. But I think now um, there's uh, there's plenty of evidence to say, look, it's unlikely they will lift rates this year. Uh, And I think that the move will be uh, towards a rate cut. I don't think it's going to happen this year. I think probably earlier next year. So what, what, what do you think about it? What do you think of the economy? And often I sit down with Kuki, Steve Kukulis, right. and we once a month we sit down together. Yeah. And um, he's a bit bearish on the economy at the moment. Um, 
You yeah, know, he was hoping for rate cuts this year, yeah. big time. But um, what do you think of the economy? What, what do you think is that? I mean, because it's like re- it's stable. Re- retail sales were has been very low relative to historic numbers. I mean, we're back to the 99-1 levels, although more recently the retail sales look like they bounced a bit, but yeah. off a low base. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, small businesses, you know, there's not a lot of – New small businesses opening up, um, quite a lot of going out of business, particularly in the um, retail and fashion. Yep. What, what do you generally? What, what's your read on the the economy at the moment? It seems to be mixed to me. There's no doubt many businesses are still doing it tough, particularly shopfronts. In my view, you look at consumer sentiment, a good measure in terms of how people are thinking of the economy. Well, those numbers suggest that uh, you know, a lot of people out there are very negative about the economy. Uh, then again, if you look at employment and employment growth, we've added in the last 12 months about 300,000 jobs. That's not too bad at all mm. for an economy that's been flatlining. A lot of them in government though. A lot of them in government. That is true. The private sector has been struggling. But nevertheless, uh, that has occurred and it might well explain why we haven't seen any a, or any real deep route in housing prices even while interest rates have risen. And I think, you know, this is one of the things which has surprised many this year is that the housing market still rose despite the rise in interest rates and people have been scratching their heads about that. So, I mean, you, you look at all the data, um, you know, we've got, and we'll talk about the head scratching bit in a second because you've got all the data. We've got um, the economy's GDP is not growing very well, you know, just certainly in relation to long-term averages. It's nowhere near it. Um, interest rates are relatively speaking high, but I'm saying relatively speaking high relative to point point one of a percent when it was, you know, that was the cash rate. But you know, they're like still four thirty five, four point three five. Yeah, Warren would argue you should have a five in front of it, um, but irrespective, it's still four point three five. That's quite a, a a big jump. But unemployment's still only four point two. That's right. And uh, and and there seem to be a lot more jobs being allocated by various governments in in the country, like I'm talking about federal, state, and local uh, governments. Um, do you think this is just window dressing that's happening at the moment? Um, and that you know, really, once the once that that spend on employment by the various governments stops, and when they stop employing more people, that we're going to see a spike in unemployment to get closer to what's going on in New Zealand, what's co- closer to going what's going on in Canada, what's going on in Europe and what's going on in the UK. They're all got a six in front of them. If the economy were to – sorry, if the federal government were to cut expenditure in a or just stop, way, or just stop, yeah. okay, just not increase No more further, new stuff, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think the economy would completely stall. Uh, now, that said, population is still expanding at a very quick, quick rate. I think it wasn't – if it wasn't for that – we also would have stalled as well. So there's been two factors. I agree with you on the government spending, but it's also been very strong population growth, yeah. which has kept the economy afloat. Can you explain to the listeners how does population growth keep the economy just motoring along? Okay. So it, it basically affects total demand in the economy and also has the ability to increase the capacity of the economy. So... I think for this year, we will have about 500 plus thousand people. Yeah, we're talking calendar year, Louis? Get calendar yep, year. Yep. So 2024, um, that I think the population will expand by north of 500,000 people. Is that including births and? Yep, natural births and over deaths, deaths plus and, migration. Right. Okay. Well, that's like double what we normally would have. It is. It is. It's, it's a very strong number. It's not necessarily a number I agree with personally. But nevertheless, it is what it is. And so with that amount of people coming in, of course, a number of those people are also bringing their wealth into the the economy and they spend. They need a home, of course. They need food and groceries. They need clothes. They go out and spend. Kids go to school. Kids go to school, all that. And that helps drive or keep the economy afloat. Now, that's one thing. But of course, if you measure the economy on a what they call a per capita basis or per person basis, the economy has actually been going backwards. So uh, GDP per capita since 2022 has fallen. I think the total fall is getting up to around 7 to 8%. That means our standard of living has been falling per person on average by 7 to 8% from 2022. That's, uh, that's quite historic. Yeah, as, it's as actually worse than what happened in 1990 to 92. Yeah, that, that's a big number. It is a big number. So would would would... 
So therefore, is um, immigration policy or whatever the, I think it's called immigration policy, is immigration policy being used as a fiscal lever? I think so. Purposefully? I think so. Yeah. Keeping in mind the government um, may claim that they were going to try and slow down migration this year. I think in the end uh, they're going to fail in terms of the target number they had by some margin. Yeah, so in, if we look at that, you said 500,000 this year. Mm. I think we had a similar number last year. Yeah, that, so that's more. total population. Uh, so last year in 2023, total population expansion was near 700,000. So we have 1.2 to 3 million people in the last 24 months. Yeah, correct. And, th th and that, I mean, apart from uh, most of those people would probably live in the – Eastern states, major cities, because that's where the jobs are. Yes, Sydney, Sydney and Melbourne, Melbourne pick up the lion's share of overseas arrivals. Right. Uh, Brisbane comes third, but it's definitely Sydney and Melbourne. They come to Sydney and Melbourne first, and then you see a secondary flow on into other states. Yeah, so th th therefore um, it, it would be fair to say that in terms of data, I can, not I can, but data can be manipulated by things like population growth. Yeah. Data can be manipulated by job numbers being increased as a result of government employing more people. Yes. And by the way, I'm not saying that um, the government departments that these people work in uh, shouldn't have these people because a lot of them are great ideas. And DIS is actually good if it's not being rorted. It's a good, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, teachers, hospitals, blah, blah, all those public servants' jobs, police, fireys, et cetera, they're all great things. I, I get it. Um, um, and, but then there's a whole lot of other people going to administration or other various departments that probably aren't all that efficient. But would oh, I don't know how cynical a person you are, but do you think there's um, some fiscal manipulation happening? I think the government's very keen to keep the country out of a recession, a yeah. formal recession, and they know good population expansion will help a lot in that. Combined with good government spending, that keeps us out of a recession, uh, that, yeah, we are in a recession per person uh, situation at the moment. Definitely our living standards have been falling uh, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So, what, 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 Louis, what, what is the – what factors, and I might suggest some, and I don't know if it's right or wrong, but that are great correlations with property prices reducing. In other words, what I mean by that too, by the way, is where – People feel like they have to sell their property, and a lot of people got two properties that so they decide they want to offload one. Yeah. What are the correlated factors? I mean, is unemployment a big important one? Like, I imagine if someone lost a job, I imagine if all of a sudden we had I don't know eight percent, six percent unemployment in the country um, instead of four point two, um, a significant increase. Um, I would imagine people who have got a mortgage are going to say, "Well, I haven't got a job anymore." Um, we've got to sell the house. Yeah, I, I think if we uh, had unemployment rise above 6%, you would see a, a, a clear rise in forced selling activity. We measure forced selling activity, by the way, and I okay. can tell you now that across the country there's about 6,000 properties selling under distress conditions. Is that a lot? No. no. It's a lot less than what we had pri prior to COVID when the number was circa about eleven to 12,000. Uh, in Prior to COVID, it was not a bad time, though. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a bad time. That's uh, right. I think unemployment might have been close to five percent. Yeah. But yep. so, the, so the number we got now of let's call it distress sales or for sales. Yep. Is less than it was pre-COVID. Absolutely. Wow. And what do you put that down to? Well, it fell sharply across twenty twenty one in particular, and that was at the time when the banks were offering a moratorium yeah, yeah. to borrowers who were struggling. Yeah. So I think that. Combined with the fact that we also hit a record low, well, I'm not sure if it was a record low, but we hit a, a like at least a 20 year low in unemployment. Yeah, we got down to 3.2. That's exactly right. Um, I think that that helped as well to keep the forced selling at bay. Now we have recorded a little bit of a pickup in forced selling. Uh, in the last 18 months, but it's still at relatively benign levels. In all honesty, I think. What's going on out there is that the home, the principal place of residence is the last asset to go when someone is under a lot of financial stress. What goes first? Well, discretionary spending goes, you know, avoiding the restaurants. Yeah. Uh, then perhaps uh, avoiding buying that car or selling a car if you have to. Uh, then after that, uh, perhaps an investment property goes. 
uh, then the holiday, the house. holiday, because people do not like giving up the holiday, right? And then after all that, sadly, would be the principal place of residence, which is quite different from other countries. So in the United States, uh, no, the, the the principal place of residence can often go first. Yeah, well, they, well, they just hand the keys back there. Exactly. Whereas in Australia, they bank, the, you'll go bankrupt. You will they, go bankrupt. And even if you're a negative equity, uh, the bank will still come and chase you. Yeah, if you had cars and other assets, you'll be selling everything. Correct. Or well, everything will be sold by the trustee in bankruptcy. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons why Australian – mortgage bonds do so well because, um, you know, we have these draconian laws in Australia r r compared to everyone else in the world relative to um, making sure you repay your debt, mortgage debt. That's right. As you know, California is nearly like a, a, um, a hallmark of um, success is about to hand the keys back on at least one property in your lifetime um, and um, and then you can go and borrow again not yeah, that, very long after. Go, get right. it, go again. Here you can't you can't borrow for five years or something and then there's a period after which you're still, you're still, still on the system, on the blacklist system. That's right. Um, I, I'm sorry, there's one more thing I think we should add to yep. this, speaking of banks, uh, and you would be very close to this, but I think over since 2008, the bank's balance sheets have been getting stronger. Yeah, totally. Uh, and their lending policies have become more and more stricter. So I think that has also ensured that they've had less bad borrowers on their books to begin with. Does that then put more pressure though on the rental market? Yes. Because, because there's less borrowers, so to speak. Yes, ultimately or, there's less borrowers and and many people struggle to actually understand this, but we need investors if we wish to increase the amount of rental stock in the marketplace. And if you actually reduce the number of investors out there, that means that you will have less established rental properties available. Yeah. It's just a simple numbers. Yeah, and, and generally speaking, the number of investors who – if you look at borrowing data, the number of investors who borrow to buy a property as an investor compared to um, owner occupiers usually travels between um, thirty-two percent and sometimes can can get as high as forty percent of any right. one month. Yep. Of course, the regulator does not like it to be that high. Regulator usually, as they did in two thousand fifteen, they made us all change um, our interest rate for investors, and they also made us. They put stricter requirements on us in terms of approving an investor loan. Yeah. Um, and we had to dial ourselves back to about 30, 30, uh, 32% or 31% or something. Um, so the regulator can sort of regulate that territory, which means there's less investors in the marketplace. Generally speaking, you would say it's better for owner occupiers because they've got more to choose from and they're not competing with an investor. Yep. You might be able to pay a bit more because they're going to rent it out. Yeah. Um, if I was to ask you to put your um, uh, – I know you don't like to do this because you're a data person, but just looking at the data today, where do you think we will be in the new year in terms of um, the economy? Do you think we could hit a technical recession? Because by then we'll have the December numbers. They'll be printed the end of January for GDP, CPI, unemployment will get through that month as well. Where do you think we'd be? Oh, that's a good question. You tell me what government spending is going to be for the December quarter. I think it'll, a lot will ride on that. Yeah. Uh, our net exports, which is, of course, a key determinant behind GDP, has been weakening of late because yeah. of the fall in iron ore prices. I think it's possible we could have at least one negative quarter. And we did forecast this year there would be at least one negative quarter. We could be wrong on that. And I must say that I've been a little bit surprised by the strength that I have seen in parts of the economy as well. And that goes back to the population change. We we thought the government would have some success in cutting migration this year, uh, but nowhere near as much as what they forecasted. But does that, does that mean they've been successful then, like in a funny way? Yeah. They've avoided a negative quarter. Yeah. Um, would it, is that, would, you, would you look at that as a successful thing? No, no not really. Uh, because, as mentioned, uh, we, we've been having a per capita recession. So uh, they may see it as a success, but the average person on the street who's struggling to meet their mortgage repayments, struggling to hold their job or trying to earn more money over and above their job, struggling to pay the rent, no, they're not seeing the economy as a great success out there right now. Maybe one lot of language you can use to explain it, perhaps, and I'd like your opinion on this. It's a it's an arithmetic success. It's a um, a database success, but it's not actually 
um, success across the board because there are segments of the, of the population, like mortgage holders, for example, who would definitely not see it as, a, as success. Yeah. No, I would agree with that. Now, things could be worse. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you remember the 1992 recession. I sure do. I certainly do as well. I was coming out of school that time. I couldn't even get a job at the supermarket. It was mm-hmm. that bad. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I had to sell my house, my family home. Yeah. Uh, so I remember what those days were like. And when you compare those times to now, I'd say we, we are certainly doing better. I mean, unemployment's still in the low fours. Uh, but people are certainly uh, struggling out there. There's no question about that. Um, so, and as mentioned before, the, the per capita decline in wealth is, is greater than what we've actually had uh, back in that 90 to 92 recession. So, yeah, I agree. It's, it's um, you know, on the face of it, it looks like we're doing okay. You scratch underneath the surface, things aren't so good. Oh, well, um, and unemployment's only 4.2. So in some respects, maybe it is, it is successful. Um, I don't necessarily agree with the way they've done it, to be honest with you. Like I, I'm – I'm a skeptic, and uh, I think we need to take some hard hits and then clean it all up and start again. That's the way I see it. But of course, we've got an election coming up, and uh, I'm, and I'm not a politician. So, um, and you know, housing affordability has not been solved. It's going to be a great debating point come the election. You think so? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, let's remember, uh, the federal government stated that they wish to build 1.2 million homes. Yep by 2029. Yeah, over the five-year period. Over the five-year period. Well, I can tell you year one, year one is now, they're falling way behind. So that's yep. 240,000 dwellings a year. If we just look at line- in a linear sense. That's yep. right. And okay. I think there are about 150, 160. Yeah, it'll be 150. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it means for the second, third year, fourth year, that run rate required. Is much more than 240. Correct. Yeah, it's a much bigger number. And uh, – and it looks like it's not going to get that. And it, from the developers I speak to, it doesn't look like that's going to be solved. No. Because developers are saying, well, it's all too hard. Yeah, correct. Uh, so unless the government does something drastic to try and lift the supply and try to really encourage the developers to get out there and have a go, uh, they will not meet the target. We'll be way off, indeed. Uh, I've, I've no doubt about it. So if this government gets re voted, re elected, yeah. Um, and they remain unsuccessful in, in, in the, so reducing the immigration number, and, and, or put it this way, they can't get it back to our long-term average, which is about growth in Australia, which is around 250,000 people. So yep. it's you know, people born minus people who die plus what we, who comes into the country. Mm. Unless they can get it back to that number, um, and, but, and if, but if unemployment keeps around the 4.2%, we're not going to see any relief on the interest rates because you know, the Reserve Bank's looking for a higher unemployment number. Yes, they they right. made that pretty clear. That's right. They, they need a higher unemployment. And the last read, we added about 45,000 jobs, if I recall the number, yeah. which is a pretty strong result. Totally. And, uh, and, and sort of a bit nerve-wracking for all those mortgage holders who are sort of sitting there waiting for some relief. Because, you know, you're right. You know, like this time last year in 2023, we will. I remember sitting down with Bill Evans, I think it was, before he retired, and Bill saying they're predicting six rate reductions in 2024. Now, obviously, it didn't happen. Um, and but people are hearing this. All the banks are predicting rate reductions. Right. Um, people are hearing saying, "Oh well, let's not sell. We should be all right. It's going to be okay." But that didn't happen. It didn't happen. That's right. I'm wondering, and this is my final question for you, Louis. I'm wondering whether or not we're all saying rate reductions sometime next year whether 2025 is going to be another 2024 and no rate reductions because unemployment remains stubbornly low, which is a good thing. People aren't losing their jobs, 4.2%. GDP just keeps bumping along the bottom but doesn't sort of descend and no one looks at GDP per capita or governments don't. We do, but generally speaking, governments don't. They just hit you you with a headline. Inflation stays sort of stubborn. I know we got a uh, a 2.7 the other day, but that's a bit of an aberration sort of stays stubbornly just above three, three, two, three, two, three, three, whatever, and rates don't get reduced because she's made it pretty clear, the Reserve Bank government's made it pretty clear, unless we get it down to those numbers sustainably, mm. there's not, she's not going to move. That's right. So that to me means a problem for the mortgage belt. It could be a real problem. And no, I wouldn't rule out that scenario at all, uh, Mark, but I am a little bit more optimistic than you in terms of getting a rate cut, and I'll tell you why. Okay. 
this time last year, one, 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 uh, one measurement I like to follow very closely are what the money markets are doing. Hmm. What are the money markets betting on? Well, this time last year, as the talk around a rate cut started to rise, the money markets were forecasting for this year no rate change. Indeed, maybe a slight chance of a rate rise. Now, the money markets are forecasting for the next 12 months up to four rate cuts. Now, the money markets aren't always right, but occasionally they're pretty good and they're reasonably pretty good at picking turning points in the market. Over and above that, we've had rate cuts uh, with other central banks, for example, the Federal Reserve, European Central Bank, Bank of England. New Zealand. New Zealand. We normally follow suit. At some stage, yeah. At some stage. So that's why I'm a little bit more optimistic, but there are risks out there. Uh, it, is, uh, it is possible that we could have a new round of inflation driven by the rise in energy prices once more due to what's happening in the Middle East. That could blow apart my, my scenario there quite easily. Rents are still rising overall, as we discussed before, and if population keeps expanding by over 2% per annum, that keeps the, the pedal to the metal. So I see your point as well. We could have another year like that. And if we do, then we're going to see more property owners struggle because they're not getting the relief that they were hoping for. So I'm, I'm put in a difficult position now. What would you say to Dr. Jim Chalmers? If Jim was sitting right here now, <laughs> what would you say to him, mate? Listen, this is what I think. It's no quick fixes, but what would you say to Jim? You know, given that, you know, the mortgage market is going to suffer. They have been suffering for a long time. I would say to Jim, you need to do everything you can to bring developers to the market. So cut property taxes to encourage new building. You encourage new building, you're increasing the capacity of the economy in many ways. Um, You're also going to relieve the rental market in time. Uh, So I think that would would help. Um, Okay, if we wish to avoid a recession, I could understand Jim still wishing to spend money to do that. Uh, but he's got to balance it out. And I think it's a fine balancing act. And I certainly wouldn't want to be him. Neither would I want to be the Reserve Bank governor right now. Two very difficult jobs indeed. Would you, would you, would you say perhaps to the Reserve Bank governor, those things aren't going to happen though, on your wish list that you just stated? RBA governor, let's put the rates up. Let's just have, let's cop, cop a real hard hit early. Warren Hogan style, and then 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 we can backpedal after that. And so, if we go into recession as a result of that, do you think the Reserve Bank government will still have a job? Maybe not. No, that's right. And I'm sure that's running running across their minds. Yeah, it's a very fine balancing act for for these key decision makers, no doubt. Well, that'll do me, Louis Christopher from SQM Research. I mean, I by the way, I, I rate your stuff, and I've been rating for a long time. Can can anybody go onto your site and look at your stuff? Absolutely, uh, sqmresearch.com.au, and I'll find their free stuff. So we all have free property data on there, and we've got some paid stuff there as well. Okay, and uh, how often do you publish your you know updates? So with the forecasts, we put them out at the end of each November, and I'm actually formulating the forecast for next year. Yep, uh, as we speak, it comes out at the end of November this end year. End of November this year. That's and, exactly right. And, so that's, and everybody can look at that. Everyone can look at that. So we we basically uh, put out about a 120 page report, and we uh, charge about fifty nine dollars for it, and we actually get down to the individual postcodes. Excellent. So and 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 you give a forecast as to what. what what does it include in the forecast, like price increases, price reductions? or Prices, rents, mainly at the capital city level, and that's what the media loves to cover, what's going on with the capital cities. But then we get down to the individual postcode. So we cover off, well, what's actually happened to each postcode over the course of the last 12 months and what we think may will happen going forward. And we actually do a risk rating for every postcode in the wow. country. So looking at how those postcodes move compared to interest rates, compared to what's going on with the local economy. Well, very good. I mean, I, I think people are – it's interesting, you know, in Australia at least, compared to other places in the world, um, Australians are really clued in on what's going on in house prices generally as opposed to, say, the United they States. They have indeed. And, look, there's a lot of media focus on it. Over my time, fortunately, property data has improved. So when I first went into this game – Property data wasn't that great. It was controlled by just a couple of bods. Now we see various bodies out there, including ourselves, CoreLogic, Domain, all out there itching to sort of be the, the authority on, on property data. But it is actually good for the community overall. Well, thanks very much, mate. You're doing a great job. Oh, so I appreciate you. it.
Cheers. Thanks, Louis.